what the goal today is to give you kind of an overview of the Austin startup scene. Um, there's no possible way I could do this justice and get everything in the Austin startup scene. Austin just, we have such an awesome scene right now, and there's so much going on. Um, so I tried my best to think of like what I thought was kind of the overview, the things that you would want to know if you were getting started and, and you wanted to plug into the different things going on. But I, I apologize in advance, because I'm sure I missed some really great things and great people and, and great other things going on. Uh, but these are some of the things that, that I have been able to connect with the most, and I've gotten the most value out of. And, and hopefully, you'll find it the same. Um, I practiced this last night. I think it'll take about a half an hour. Uh, and then hopefully there's lots of time for questions. If you want to stop me in the middle and ask a question, you can just raise your hand and yell it out or do whatever. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, if you don't, I'll just keep talking. So um, to start off with, I wanted to put this up first. This is a, um, a, a map of the Austin entrepreneur scene that was put together by Bajoy Goswami, who is a, a good, good friend of mine and someone that really, I feel like, kind of introduced me to the Austin startup scene. And this, this is a site that lets you create these kind of maps, but he's curated it to make what he thinks is uh, all the different things going on here in Austin. And um, so it's really a good resource. It's a way to get it up more stuff. And if you want to find that, it's at, you can use bit.ly instead of barely. They both work the same. But uh, <laughs> bit.ly slash Austin scene is a, is a great way to go see that. And that's just got all these different things, and it's trying to be a comprehensive list of everything going on. And so a lot of things, the first place I looked when I wanted to go make this presentation was there at the map to see what things I was missing or needed to put on here. <coughs> and that's part of a larger project that Bajoy has been working on with Heather McKissick called um, the ATX Equation. And that tries to map out all are the you, different scenes. Are you going to have these slides available anywhere? Yes. Should we try to copy You can take pictures of everyone, but I will post them too. Okay. And I actually, I, when, I, when I practiced this last night, I recorded the whole thing. So I'll probably just post either this recording or the other recording of it all. So you, you don't need to do that. So ATX Equation basically shows all the different scenes. It talks about the, uh, just all that's going on in Austin, and the music scene, and the film scene, and the gaming scene, and just a lot of different things going on here. And it's, it's another great resource. Uh, one of the resources I'm most excited about is one that I, I helped put together called We're Austin Tech. I just realized we don't have audio, um, so uh, normally this makes music. There you go. That works. I don't even know where the speaker is. Um, but this is another great site, and <laughs> what's great about We Are Austin Tech is that you can hear from not just from me, but from lots of other really great people in the Austin community. And what it is is a site where we've gone and done about three to five minute interviews with a lot of the um, greatest entrepreneurs and, and leaders in the tech community here. And uh, we're just getting started. We're probably about 30 interviews up there right now. Kind of like I was saying before, there, you know, obviously there's a lot more than 30 people um, doing great things in Austin. But, it, but it's great because you can go and you can connect with some of these people that you may have heard about or may not have met before um, and get to hear in their words why they think you know, Austin's such a special place and why, why they've chosen to live here and to grow their businesses here um, and uh, what the, how they plug into the tech community. And so lots of great people that I'll mention today have their own interviews and, and own comments up here on the site. So I'd really encourage you to check that out. We put out a new video every Tuesday. Um, so every Tuesday, if you can sign up by email, or you can just check the site or follow it on Twitter. But, um, but every Tuesday, a new interview comes out that's a three to five minute interview with somebody awesome. Um, so first I want to talk about uh, just a couple principles of the Austin startup scene, things that I think are kind of maybe differentiate us a little bit from other cities. Um, you know, every, we're going to have things in common with lots of places. Um, and these aren't things that are com like only Austin, for example, focuses on bootstrapping. But these are things that I think as you, as you nose around, you'll start to get a feel for what really makes Austin special and, and what sticks out for our community. And one of those is this is a bootstrap first kind of place. Um, it's not the only way to do things, but a lot of the most successful companies, they go start off and they figure out a way to kind of make things work on their own a little bit. And they, they maybe get, figure out a way to get something built without necessarily going and raising a lot of money. Um, they, maybe they talk to a lot of customers first and get some feedback, and they've got some customers lined up. Um, and um, kind of inherent with that is that they're focused on making money. So um, you know, I, you can probably do anything anywhere. Austin's probably not the best place to do a consumer internet company that's just based on getting eyeballs. Um, it's just hard to do here. It's going to be hard to get that company funded. It's going to be hard to get, uh, to, to, it's not necessarily the best place to, to get attention for it or grow it. Um, this is a great place to do like a B2B SaaS business with recurring revenue. 
Um, it could be a B2C company that's SaaS and recurring revenue, um, but, but you know, something that's where people are going to pay for it as soon as you give it to them, and they're going to pay every month and things like that. People really like those kinds of things here. And if you can get a business to a small amount of traction where it's got a few customers and a little bit of revenue, it's, it's much easier. That company is easy to get funded here and to help people help grow that. Uh, people move to Austin for the quality of life, and so that's really important here. And I don't, that doesn't mean that people here don't work hard. I think people do work hard here, but they also play really hard too. And, uh, and a lot of people come, people are coming here all the time. That's pretty well documented. There's more of a, an inflow than an outflow. Um, and when I talk to people that moved here, it's because they wanted to be able to buy a house to live in. They wanted to have, um, they wanted to participate in such, you know, the great music scene and the other things going on here. They want to do things outdoors. Um, they just, they, they realize that as much as work's really important and they're really passionate about their startup and what they're doing, there's actually a little bit more to life besides that. And from another perspective, you know, Austin's a great place to be poor. Um, you know, a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of entrepreneurs are poor. That's kind of the nature of it. You're trying to make every dollar go as far as you can. And then you can have a really great time here for nothing. There's, there's so much going on around the city that's free, that's open, you can participate in. Um, you know, there's uh, South by Southwest is one of my favorite events of, of the year. Um, it's a great event. I get a badge every time. I get to do all the other stuff. You can totally do South by without a badge and just have tons of fun, see tons of shows, meet lots of people. And there's lots of things like that going on all year round that, that um, really make this a great quality of life and a great place to be. Another really thing about Austin um, that also uh, I, I first heard Bajoy talk about is, uh, is social capital is really important here. And it's not like it's the only place that it's important, but it's really important here. And people here, they help each other out, and they lift each other up. And, uh, and that, that stuff goes around and it comes around. And so, um, you know, in Austin, when you want to plug into things, the first thing that you should do is go figure out how you can go help somebody else out. And, uh, and you're going to find that, when it, that people are really receptive to, uh, to meeting each other and to doing different things. And that when you build up that social capital, that that's going to come back to you and it's going to be helpful to you later. And so, and that's just that's just the kind of place that it is. And uh, and finally, for me, it's it's really this feeling of that that I think is seen across the board that it's a rising tide. We're not all fighting over the same thing. This isn't a zero sum game. We can all win and we can all grow and get bigger. And everybody here realizes that it's better for all of us when we all win. Every big Austin success story makes it easier for all the rest of us to go do our thing and take the next step. Um, and when you, when you learn about entrepreneurial communities and what it takes to grow things up, it really is, um, you, it's not just one thing. Like your company can't be successful by itself. You need an ecosystem to be successful in. You need other people to hire. You need people to invest in your company. You need all these other people to partner with, all these other things. And, and that's a rising tide situation that we're so fortunate to be in right now. Um, when people ask me about, about Capital Factory and what kind of companies we're trying to attract here, are we trying to get people to move here from outside of Austin? Are we trying to bring them in? Are we just, it's like, I'm just like, you know, I'm just trying to, I feel like all I have to, so many companies are already moving here, so many great people are already moving here. I, my job is not convincing people to move to Austin. I'm just trying to grab all the great people that are already here and get them all together and, and make good things happen with them. Um, I don't even think about trying to convince people to move here. I don't have to do that. They're figuring that out on their own. So, um, one of the first things, if you want to get a pulse on the Austin startup scene that I'd recommend, um, is that you go sign up for the Austin Startup Digest. Uh, I'm a little biased. I, I helped curate this. But basically, this is the calendar. And a guy named Tom Meredith, who's a, a really uh, successful uh, uh, business leader here in Austin, he was very involved in Dell for a while, um, and uh, he gave me this tip. He said, if you, know, if you really want to um, be plugged into something, control the calendar. Because then, then that, that's like a, a key piece. And so the Austin Startup, Cal the Startup Digest is a, is a calendar of all the great things that are going on in the upcoming weeks. And um, if you sign up for it, you can go to this page anytime and see it. But you can also sign up by email. And then every Monday morning, you'll get an email from me um, that's kind of like a little intro about what I'm most excited about. But then most importantly, it's here's the calendar. Here's all the stuff coming up that you'd want to go to. And so that's a great way to stay plugged into what's going on. And if you know of stuff going on, I'd love to hear about it so I can include it in there. Right now, it goes to about 4,000 people. Uh, most of, I'd say probably actually about half of them in Austin, probably about half of them people outside of Austin that are trying to keep a pulse on what's going on in Austin. Um, and so you sign up for that at startupdigest.com slash Austin. And definitely you should just do that right now on your phone. Like now. You should all go <laughs> sign up for that. All of you should go. Is anybody, is anybody on it? Some of you are. Okay, so the rest of you, right now, you need to go sign up. Um, and so real quickly, I want to talk about just the overall calendar. This is not the Startup Digest, but this is more like what the year looks like. And so um, 
There's stuff going on all year round. I'm sure I've missed a lot of great things. These are some of the things that I, that I get most excited about. Um, one of the things coming up uh, at the beginning of next year, there's an HTML5 Texas conference. We have a bunch of like Texas conferences. There's a HTML5 Texas. There's the Lone Star Ruby conference, which is like the Rails, Ruby and Rails programmers for, Austin, for Texas. Um, you know, Texas likes to do things its own way. Um, but that's, that's one great one coming up. You'll notice uh, in March and April, Lots of stuff going on. Obviously, South by Southwest being an anchor to all that. We do a startup crawl around then. Three-day startup does a hackathon in the spring. Rise does a great entrepreneurship week in the spring. Then you'll notice a whole bunch of stuff in the fall, too. October, November, what we're going through right now. This is busy time, right? Austin City Limits Music Festival. Next week, it's going to be two weekends. Uh, between that, we have Austin Startup Week. Anybody go to Startup Week this week? This, this, Two couple weeks ago, a couple of you. So that was a really great, uh, great event. We had uh, all kinds of stuff going on all week to showcase the great things going on in Austin. Um, the uh, we do another crawl. There's a game developer conference, which is a big event that brings a lot of people in from out of town. November, we've got three A startup coming up actually uh, this weekend. Formula One coming up for the first time this year, which will, isn't necessarily startup specific, but it's just bringing tons of great uh, other people and attention and things to Austin. Um, and uh, and then there's a big holiday party at the end. And so you'll notice that um, most things happen in the spring, in March and April, and in October and November. And there's a good reason for that. That's because it's, it's really fucking hot here in the summer. <laughs> and um, so we do all, we're still, uh, most people are still here and there's stuff going on, but it's not exactly the time when you go like try to bring all kinds of people to Austin in the middle of, of uh, July and August. Um, so mostly people are at Barton Springs or, or you know, doing other things and um, we're working. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the layout of the year. So I mentioned, I mentioned Austin Startup Week. This is one of the events that if you're trying to get a feel for the scene, that's really what it's all about, is a way to plug people into what's going on. And so we do this uh, every October. We do it, uh, in the past, we've always done it the week before ACL, or we've done it the week before ACL. Now it's gonna be the week between ACL, since it's two weekends. But basically all we do is we get every group in town to hold, hold their events all the same week. And then a bunch of events that wouldn't, you know, don't always happen all, normally happen all during that week as well. And so that it's just like every day, every night, there's startup stuff going on all the time. Any different group or you'd be interested in meeting or being part of, um, it's really easy to plug into those and meet those. We try to get as many people from outside of Austin to come during then so that they can experience that. And we're trying to sell them on coming here or joining some of the great companies that are here. Um, and, and there's just tons of stuff goes on. So the, the Rails programmers have their meetup, and the PHP programmers have their meetup, and the Lean Startup people have their meetup. And besides all the meetups happening, we did a great startup crawl. Um, we're basically, I think about 40 startups um, downtown all through a party at the same time. Uh, about maybe like 20 of them were up here and had like little stations up here. Even if they weren't a downtown startup, they could set up a little table up here. But then there were a whole bunch of other startups all, all around the kind of 6th Street in the downtown corridor. We had a, a shuttles uh, driving loops between them and everybody throwing a party at once. And so basically you could go and see every different, you know, kind of all different startups in town, see their, what their space is like, meet the founders and the people that are there. Um, and, and again, just trying to kind of celebrate what we have going on. And so that was a really great event. Um, we also did a demo day. Um, we had in this room here, it was set up just like this, with the, but a little bit more fancy. And we had 100 investors in the room representing about a billion dollars uh, in, in investment money. And uh, I think about 16 companies got up and pitched. Um, and uh, and I know I know at least five or six companies that have gotten you know a bunch of funding just from that two weeks ago and that are and it's, that's still kind of rolling in so that was that was really really successful. And then you can't talk about the Austin startup scene without talking about South by Southwest. Um, have you guys who's been to South by? It's like the same people raise their hands for everything. So either you guys just aren't raising your hands or you just have you you're, you haven't done anything. Um, but, uh, but South By is, is an incredible event. It started out really actually as a music festival. It grew to being a film festival. And now everyone's kind of forgotten about that. And everyone focuses on the interactive festival, which is bigger than the other parts. And I don't, nobody hasn't really forgotten about those. But, but that's what we focus on is the interactive part. And uh, I think the interactive part alone brings in about 25,000 people. Um, it happens in the convention center, which if we were on the other side, you could see um, right, right down the way a bit. Um, and it really takes over all of downtown um, in addition to bands playing all the time and the film festival going on. There's the convention with talks and speakers and people coming to Austin from around the country and around the world. Uh, and just and, and it's really just like a five or six day party um, that is uh, with, with all the, the tech people and the startup people and, and everyone else that you'd, you'd want to hang out with me. It's just incredible. And uh, really puts the spotlight on Austin and has really helped to, to elevate Austin. And when you ask people that aren't from Austin uh, about it, that's one of the first things they'll mention is, is, is South by. Um, so it's a, a huge asset that we have, and we're, we're really fortunate to be rising that, uh, rising with that tide. 
Um, so that happens in March, and um, and it's it's the kind of thing like if you think you're going to do something next March at South by, you're already too late. Like South by gets planned pretty much a year in advance, and it seems like it's uh, really it seems like it's really really far in advance, but it's just such a big event. And there's so much going on that literally like. Most of the stuff for South by is already figured out right now, and they're trying to lock it down. And then in January, there'll be all these people scrambling, going like, "I want to do an event at South by. I want to throw a party." I want to, and like, all the venues are booked. Everything's already figured out. Um, it, it's really hard to do something last minute. It's something you, you really need to plan in advance. So next, I wanted to give you a quick little history lesson. Um, what I think about is the history of the Austin startup scene. And I came here in '99, so I don't. I actually didn't. It's not like I lived through all this or anything. But this is for me talking to other people and. What I, what I hear about and what, what I've learned. Um, and one of the first things, the oldest kind of thing I hear about in the Austin startup scene is MCC. Who's heard of MCC? Smaller number of hands. There's an, do you remember where the, the MCC building is? The MCC building, is it's up north. It's now called the West Pickle Research Center as part of the university. But um, it's this big bunker looking building um, that was, uh, you know, cost tens of millions of dollars to create. Um, it's a big campus up near the Arboretum. And what was so significant about it is it was one of the first big de like economic development projects where people in the community, particularly the Chamber of Commerce and others, worked really hard to go convince this company to come here and invest in Austin. And, uh, and that set, seemed to set off just a chain of events that brought, brought in more companies and other, other groups. Um, and it just kind of harkens back to one of the, the key events in our history that made that happen. So you'll see lots of things that happen up at this building that now is owned by the university, and ATI is up there, the Austin Technology Incubator, 3A Startups happening up there this weekend. Um, so there's a lot of things that go on up there, and you'll hear it referred to as the MCC building, the MCC building. That was MC I don't even know what MCC stands for. Uh, does anybody know what MCC stands for? Microcomputer or something. I don't know. Um, this was like chip days, you know, back when we were Silicon Hills and it was a, it was a chip, it was a chip <laughs> thing. And so the key person in all that is a guy named Pike Powers. Pike Powers is still with us now. He's just often rec uh, he's just received a, a number of uh, honors and recognitions uh, around the um, the Pecan Street project, which is an energy project going on. But Pike uh, has been involved, was really involved in in that, in many of the other economic things that have happened here. And he was uh, working. With, his mentor was a guy named George Kosmetsky, which is officially beyond my time. But he was another one of the great um, kind of proponents of the Austin t uh, tech community and, and really helped to make all this happen. Um, and for, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But but we still have Pike, and Pike's just an amazing guy. And someone you'll I'm sure you'll if you come to these things you'll see Pike around. Um, and uh, a another amazing asset that we have here in Austin. And you can go watch his interview on uh, We Are Austin Tech if you want to learn all about him. So another thing that you can't miss when you talk about the Austin startup scene or Austin is Dell. Um, you know, everybody at Dell is like, especially outside of Austin, that's what they think of as like the big company success story here in Austin. It's Dell, you know, like, oh, there must be a bunch of Dell people involved in that. Or, oh, did you go, to, did you work at Dell? Um, you know, it's funny because, like, to me, you know, Dell's like a, you know, like, I don't know, like fifty billion dollar company or something. It's not a start. It's not a startup anymore. Um, I don't think of it really as a startup. And it's a hardware company. And I'm kind of a software guy. And most of the, a lot of the stuff happening in startups is, is software stuff. Um, but it, it was a really big impact on the on the startup community. And a big part of that was that um, it created Dellionaires, and that is like an official Austin term. There are Dellionaires, and those are people that made millions of dollars at Dell. And, um, and those people went off and they started a bunch more companies and they invested in companies and that created kind of a chain reaction. And, and that's going to be a theme through this as we talk about a bunch of these other companies. This is what makes a startup scene. It's, you have to have one company be successful and they're, they're truly, regardless of your political philosophies, in, in startup world there is a trickle down effect. And, uh, and when one big company has a big success, that creates a whole bunch of wealth, it creates a whole bunch of experience, it creates a whole bunch of inspiration. And those are the three things that come together to go make people go start more companies. And you need to have that happen more than once, over and over, um, for a startup community to really develop. And, and Dell was a huge part of, of the beginning of that. That in, created a whole bunch of angel investors and a whole bunch of entrepreneurs that went on to go do a bunch more things. And fortunately, we had a bunch of examples of that. Tivoli is another one. Tivoli was uh, an Austin Ventures company uh, that I believe went public and then got bought by IBM. Um, and uh, if you, you, know, you look at a number of other companies since then, and many of them were started by Tivoli founders. You look at a bunch of VCs, and a bunch of them are people that made a bunch of money at Tivoli and learned this, their, the ropes there, and now are venture capitalists. And so you know, you, there's, at some point, I know people have done versions of this at different times, but there needs to be like a family tree showing kind of like, 
Dell and Tivoli and, uh, and Trilogy and some of these others and showing like all the companies that have spun out of those and come out of them. And it'd be, it'd be a, really, a really interesting web. Trilogy, I just mentioned, is another one. Trilogy is what brought me to Austin. Trilogy was started by, by a guy named Joe Lemont. And in, in my time here since 99, I feel like Trilogy has been probably the single biggest impact on the Austin tech and startup community. And um, Trilogy was an enterprise software company. Um, what they did, you know, they built basically, if I was, was going to try to summarize, they built websites for really big companies like Boeing and Sun and uh, Compaq and others. Um, and uh, But what was so powerful about what Trilogy did is Trilogy was intently focused on recruiting and, re and bringing to Austin the very best talent in the world that they could find. And um, for them, what that meant was they, they were competing against Microsoft and Google to recruit engineers from Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, and MIT in particular. And uh, over the course of about four or five years, they brought in thousands of really, really smart people and injected them with some really entrepreneurial uh, DNA. Um, I was super fortunate to participate in what they called Trilogy University, which was a summer program where you came in right out of school and you were basically put into a situation to, to work to, uh, where there were like, in my class, I think there were like 150 people. And so we all split into teams and created startups and there was almost kind of an el elimination style process to the end where at the end there were maybe like five startups at the end of the summer. Um, and this was like before Y Combinator, before, you know, Y Capital Factory or anything like that. But in a lot of ways, this is actually what I based Capital Factory on was the experience that I had going through that. And, and, um, and that was really great. It brought all these incredible people to Austin and most of them stayed. And that's what was so powerful. And so if you now go look around at most of the other really successful companies in Austin, there's like herds of trilogy people that move around between them. And like the, the leadership and the kind of the, the the most, the, a lot of the most significant individual con contributors, a lot of them are Trilogy people. And if you are a CEO of a big tech company in Austin, you know what the Trilogy people are like and why you want to go get Trilogy people. Um, and, that's, and it's also created a super powerful kind of alumni network um, here in Austin that, that we're able to leverage. And so that was a, just a huge impact. It was because of all these smart people that, that um, Trilogy ejected into Austin and, and that stayed here. Uh, most recently, we have Bizarre Voice. Uh, Bizarre Voice is one of the more recent uh, IPOs here in Austin. I was uh, super fortunate to get involved at the very beginning and was able to help uh, kind of in the early days getting that started um, and, uh, and, get, and be able to watch it as it grew, I guess, over the past maybe six or seven years that it took to, uh, to IPO. And um, what we're seeing right now, and I know we've got some in the audience here, uh, is, is the effect of what happens when, when a company like that goes public and, and, and creates a success story like that. And so, we'll, you know, what's the ripple down effect? Well, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that they're there at the first day, and they got, you know, millions and millions of dollars, right? And a lot of them are, some people might go retire, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people are like, wow, wow, that was cool. I like that. I'm going to go do that again. And a lot of those people are in, in becoming angel investors. They say they, they met all these other people. They know other people at Bizarre Voice or at other companies. And they start being kind of the seed capital to help those things get started. And then there's this next level group of people that all came in that were like not the very first employees, but maybe they were like <clears throat> you know, there in the first year or two. And they still made a really lot of money. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm just making up numbers. I don't know exactly what anybody made. But maybe instead of many millions of dollars, maybe they only made a couple million dollars. Or maybe they made hundreds of thousands of dollars. But it was still a life-changing event for them. And those people are also probably going off and angel investing a little bit. But they're also really likely to go start their own company because they're like, wow, now I've got a little bit of, bit of freedom. I can maybe I can work for a year without any pay maybe because I, I don't have to pay myself. Um, and, uh, and they got a taste of it. And they're like, wow, like, that guy next to me just made $10 million. Like, I want to go do that. Um, and, uh, and it really inspires them, too. So it gives them the means. They, and they learned, so, I, I don't want to overlook, they learned so much, right? The people, they saw, they were there at the very beginning in Bizarre Voice, and they saw it grow and get better. So they feel like, I saw all that happen. I know what's involved. I know what to do there. And, and, and it's also so much more achievable and attainable, right? Because, they, again, they saw it happen. It's not something, some dream of some other company. Like, they were there in the middle of it. It's like, it makes it real. And then there's the next group of people that came in after them that maybe didn't make that much money on it, but they were sitting next to somebody that did, right? And they know, like, they're looking around. Like, all these people around me just made a crap load of money. And they saw all those same things, and they learned those same things, and they met all those same people, and they want to go start a company. Because, like, man, if they can do that, I can do that. Like, I want to go do that. And they can go to their buddies who just did make a whole bunch of money, and they'll invest in them to go start their next company. And that is happening today, left and right. 
Um, and I'm, you know, I know lots of bizarre voice people coming out and, and starting companies now. And uh, fortunately, in this particular case, the CEO, Brett Hurt, is, you know, he's very entrepreneurial. He's done a number of companies, and I think, you know, as much as nobody wants to see people that they, they're good, their people leave and go work somewhere else. Um, I think, you know, he's, it's a big company and he understands that as a company grows, some of that's going to happen and he's able, been able to be very, very supportive of that and, and help those companies get started. Um, and so, uh, so Bizarre Voice is just going to be a huge impact on the Austin startup community. We're seeing it now, but we're going to continue to see that for years. And there's other examples of that. Homeway was another recent IPO, um, and uh, we're seeing the same thing there. Uh, and you know, lots of great uh, uh, entrepreneurs and engineers that have both created a lot of wealth, gained a lot of experience, and, and seen others be successful, and they're going to go off and start more companies. Uh, and then most recently, uh, one of my favorite companies in town is a company called Indeed. They were totally under the radar. <clears throat> Almost nobody knew how big of a company this was or how great they were doing. Uh, I don't have any inside information, uh, but I, what I read in the paper was it was probably sold for about a billion dollars. It was a private company. They probably could have gone public, but they didn't. And um, so another huge exit uh, with, uh, with a ton of people there that um, probably did, you know, did very well, that I went all through, through the, all those other things we said before, and that we're going to see just a continuous ripple of new companies coming out of Indeed, new companies coming out of Homeway, new companies coming out of Bizarre Voice, and others. And uh, like I said, you can't just have, it takes more than one of these. And so what we're seeing in Austin now is this string. These three happened in the past year. And that's really powerful. That, that is, is going to have a big effect that we're seeing all those happening at once. And what's that mean for next year? What's that mean for the year after that? And there's more coming. Um, so. Uh, there's a, you know, again, I, I'm sure I didn't hit all of them here, but there's a ton of great up-and-coming companies that are going to be the next success stories. Probably the next one's Whale Shark, if you've heard of Whale Shark Media, but they're another Austin Ventures company. You'll notice a trend here, Homeway, Bizarre Voice. Um, but uh, but that, you know, they're they're doing really, really well. They're growing really fast, and, and you know, unless somebody else, like Indeed, somebody buys them, I wouldn't be surprised if they're the next big Austin IPO. But there's more of them coming, and more great companies growing here. So, um, you haven't asked any questions. Any questions about any of that stuff? One question. Somebody give me a question. That's a good question. Um, no. At least not right now. You needed a question. I did need a question. Here's one. So, you said that that's a great question. So the question was that I, I commented that Austin's a bootstrap first kind of place. He said, is that because there's a lack of capital or because we just like bootstrapping? Um, so first I want to clarify that it does, it, when I said that, it, I said bootstrap first. I didn't say bootstrap only. So it doesn't mean you, that companies don't raise money. It just means that it's kind of past the, I just have an idea, just give me money. Um, and you've got to go prove something or do something first on your own. And, um, you know, I'm going to get to talk about funding in a bit, but I commonly hear usually companies that didn't get funded complaining that there's not enough funding in Austin. And, um, and I really don't agree with that. I'll talk a little bit in more detail about it, but I really don't agree. I think there's plenty of funding in Austin. There's a lot of early stage funding. Um, there's a lot of growth capital. There are a lot of companies outside of Austin that are happy to invest in Austin companies. Um, and just to put a finer point on it, I feel like I know, I work really hard to meet most of the startups. Like I know most of them. I don't know any that are really good startups that didn't get funded. So. As a, that my experience is the really good companies all get funded. I'm not saying it, some take a little longer than they wanted to. You know, like I'm not saying like everybody just like people throw money at them. But the good companies end up getting funded and end up growing. And usually, if a company's not getting funded, I look at it and I'm like, yeah, there's something. There's a reason why that company is not getting funded right now. Um, there's something they need to fix there. And so um, you, know, you have to worry about selection bias a little bit when you hear people complain about things because usually the people complaining are the people that didn't get funded. And so. I'm not saying, you know, I'm sure there are some exceptions there, but overall, no, good companies all get funded. There's plenty of money for good companies here. But there's an expectation that you have a business model and you know how to make money and grow it. And similar to the inspiration piece, you know, the companies that investors and entrepreneurs here are inspired by 
are generally companies that are making money out of the business model. And I do think it'd be much harder to start a company here that uh, didn't have a clear business model, was primarily based on you know, collecting eyeballs and, and customer acquisition mm -hmm. in a consumer way, um, because we don't have those success stories to look at. People can't look next to them and say, oh yeah, that person just did that, that person just did that. Whereas in Silicon Valley, you, you, they do, you do have those examples. And there are plenty of people that did make lots of money that way, and they're willing to go take that bet. But th I think that it's the, it's the it's the fact that we don't have those examples here. We don't have those success stories that makes that a lot harder. And all, one last thing is also even expertise. We don't have a lot of consumer internet expertise. And I hear a lot of people complain about that. So I think those are much more the problems than money. Money follows the talent and the ideas and the people. And if we had the right people and the right talent, it's, it's easy to get the money here. So what would you see as kind of the evolving next trend, you know, as you begin to see companies bubbling beneath the surface I mean, you've got, you know, like Mass Relevance that does you know, social commerce for IBM and others. What, what's kind of bubbling beneath the surface right now? Bubbling, I don't know about bubbling beneath the surface. Um, I, the yeah, I, I don't think this probably isn't going to sound that, that shocking or, or insightful, but, you know, mobile's eating the world. You know, mobile, mobile is everything. Everything is mobile. Everything's becoming mobile. And Austin has a really strong mobile story um, that, um, that we have really high mobile adoption here, that we have got some of the biggest mobile development companies in the world based here in Austin. So there's a lot of mobile developers. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think m mobile is really clear. Uh, big data is something that Austin's really strong at and, and doing well with. Um, and I'm, I'm sure right after this, I'll think up something I should have said. Somewhat self-interested plug for e-commerce. Um, yeah, and social commerce even, you know, taking another step. I think mean, you know, so there's a lot, you know, and um, I, that, this is not something new. But another thing people I think uh, I've often commented about Austin being really good at is they'll call it the consumerization of IT. And so this is um, generally taking things that were enterprise software that you sell to companies but providing the service in a way that you buy it like a consumer does. So it's like a business service, but you just go to a website and sign up with a credit card and buy it. It's not a big enterprise sales type thing. Um, that, Austin, is really good at, too. So what's the comparative advantage of starting up a company in Austin? The comparative advantage. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think it's a uh, low cost of living. Uh, it's a great, um, a really supportive environment. Um, it's easy to attract talent here and get people to move here. Um, it, there's much, as much as talent's really um, uh, competitive everywhere, there's a lot less poaching here, <laughs> both because there's, it's, it's not so much like in Silicon Valley where like, oh, that's the hot company, and like everybody goes there, um, and people are expecting to switch jobs really quickly, but also just for the reason why people came here. People came here for quality of life is one of the reasons, and so it's important to them, moving jobs every year is not a high quality of life. <laughs> Um, you know, like people want to like be part of something and 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 contribute to it and feel like they're part of it and and that that is you know retention is is a really important part of keeping people here too. Um, but you know it's the kind of thing like you should come here because you love it because you you look around and you're like this is the place I want to be and you know there, there are lots of places you can do a startup. Um, it's not like Silicon Valley is a bad place to do a startup. You'd be crazy to say that. It's a, you know, obviously a great place to do a startup. Um, but there are trade offs to everything and you, you know it's the kind of thing where you should come to Austin and you should feel like ah oh, I get the trade offs. This is the right place for me. Josh, um, I recently moved here from New York and worked for AOL and Warner Brothers and CBS, and you know I definitely moved here for the quality of life. When you talk about consumer-facing media and the lack thereof <coughs> in Austin, um, you know when I when I see these on the board and I've spoken to multiple of the, uh, you know a lot of these organizations, and the one thing that you know the challenge is is they want enterprise sales, but they you know and that's what's in Austin DNA. You know how is that changing and how do you sort of make it happen and get in there um, versus you know the straight up SaaS? Are you saying when you're th they want to hire people that have enterprise sales yes. experience and yes. and and how do you get into that if you don't have enterprise sales right. experience? Yeah, I mean it's it's sort of a challenge that I've been you know, facing. So it's like okay, well maybe I should be starting my own business. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I have a magic answer for that. I mean, I think there, there certainly are a lot of different kinds of companies, and there are a lot of enterprise software companies, but there are, are a number that, you know, that, that aren't as well. Um, you know, for example, Whale Shark is a consumer internet company. I mean, they're a very specific kind, and, you know, they work in a very, it's not like, I don't think of a traditional one, but, you know, they're more consumer. Um, and they'll, they'll probably be a mix through here, but... Uh, Why do you think that, you know, publishers haven't really um, developed here? 
because it's really inherent in the DNA, it's that SAS model, uh, the enterprise software sale? I'm not sure. I think there are some publishers here, but I mean, I don't think it's like a, yeah, it's not a core strength. Um, you have CDs kind of have their pockets, right? And so, um, you know, if I were doing publishing, I think I would probably be in, in New York where there's a ton of that there. Cool. Well, there'll be, there'll be time for more questions. Thank you for giving me a bunch. And uh, let's, let's jump through here. So people. So um, there are a bunch of people. Austin's a people place. And there are a bunch of people that you'll find whose names come up over and over that are involved in organizing a lot of different events and things going on. Uh, if you want to know about the Ruby on Rails community, you want to talk to Damon Clink Scales. You know, he, he runs the, the biggest Rails meetup group. He's often, he's involved in many, many other things too, but he is like the Rails dude. Um, and uh, he also runs Open Coffee, which is a great meetup. He runs the Founder Dating Network, which is a great way to meet a co-founder. Um, so he's involved in a bunch of great things. Jacqueline Hughes uh, helps, uh, is the organizer of Startup Week um, and many other things. She's plugged into a lot of different things going on here. She's involved in Rise, she's involved in others. But Joy, who I mentioned before, he started the Bootstrap Group, which for me was really kind of one of the first entrepreneurial communities in Austin and what brought me into it. Alex Jones puts on Refresh Austin. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later more about Bob Metcalf. He really is kind of the, I think, the figurehead of entrepreneurship at the university right now and is a huge asset to, to UT and to us and many other people that, that make all these things happen. And so, um, so there are a lot of people involved and all these people are really approachable, they're easy to talk to and they're out at things, they're easy to find and to go meet. And so they're, they're kind of an entry point. Like you go, to, you go to one of these people and you're like, hey, I'm trying to find people into this, this, and this. And they're going to be like, oh, you should talk to this person. Let me introduce you to this person. Like that's just what they do. Um, and, and so you want to use that and leverage that. Uh, there are a bunch of happy hours to go to. So um, the biggest one is the tech happy hour, I think. That happens um, once a month. And it's usually at Molotov. I think sometimes now they're doing it at Dogwood. Um, but that's uh, just a, it's just a happy hour where there's a bunch of tech people in a bar. And, um, and that's a, it's a great opportunity to meet people. And there's people that show up there that don't go to other events. Um, and, uh, and so that's one I particularly really like. There's another one called the Big Ass Social Happy Hour that's put on by Lena Rosales. Um, that's another really big event where, um, where a lot of people from kind of, you might see on Twitter or other places or kind of getting together in meet space. Um, we do a music tech happy hour here at Capital Factory. We're trying to nurture the evolving music technology um, startups here in Austin. Now, the next one is November 30th here. Uh, and then InfoChimps does a big data love happy <coughs> hour for big data companies. And, and I'm sure there's a bunch more. These are just some examples. But all the time there are different meetups and events going on. And happy hour is kind of one of the easiest ways to go meet people because there's alcohol and you no know, formal programming and you just show up and shake people's hands. Um, so th those are really good events. There's a bunch of coffee shops that are kind of like entrepreneurial hangouts. Um, downtown, uh, Cafe Medici, um, Halcyon, um, Joe's on Second. Um, you'll just you go there and you're going to see other entrepreneurs there and people meeting there. Um, and then uh, one of my favorites is a place called Lola Savannah. It's out on Bee Cave Road. That's out kind of in the Westlake Bee Cave uh, Barton Creek area. And you know there's ones up north. There's ones down south. There's you know depending on your hood. There's there's kind of like the preferred coffee shop where people go and work and do things. Uh, and then there are bars that stick out too. There's a place called the Ginger Man. Um, where am I pointing? The Ginger Man. Um, and uh, that's a common place for people to go after meetups and hang out. The, uh, if you want to go get kind of the VC crowd, they're usually hanging out at the W Bar. Um, <laughs> that's like a little more, more upscale. Um, and uh, Buffalo Billiards is another place where a lot of people end up after meetups and happy hours and things like that. Or rent out Buffalo Billiards to host an event, things like that. And then next is co-working spaces. Um, these are places now, I'm kind of like working up the pier from like happy hours, coffee shops and bars. Now we've got co-working spaces. Um, so these are places where, you know, like this, where you can um, ba you know, basically have a desk, a little, you know, a little bit more comfortable spot than a coffee shop, um, faster internet maybe, um, and more importantly, be surrounded by other like-minded people, people that are working on similar things and doing different things. Um, Capital Factory, where you are now, is the largest uh, one in Austin. We have 22,000 square feet. We're, we're the only one downtown or right in the middle of downtown. Um, and we're really focused on tech startups. So you actually, like, people don't really apply to be a Capital Factory. Companies do. Startups do. And I think that's one thing that really makes us different than most of the other ones in town. Um, but as you try, go to these different ones, you'll find each one really is a community. Each one has its own kind of flavor and focus. Um, and. and uh, I don't, I don't really think of them as, com as co competitive, but often actually much more collaborative. Conjuncture was one of the first co-working spaces in Austin. They're over on the east side, really cool little old house they've converted. Uh, a lot of uh, web designers and freelancers there. GoLab uh, is a smaller space that actually is down near, near the convention center. 
CoSpace is up north near the Arboretum, as well as Link Coworking and Tech Ranch. Um, so there's a, a lot of different options, and, 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 and there's, a, there's a whole bunch more co-working spaces besides this. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot of different places. I think these are the ones that tend to focus more on tech startups. Um, and so like I said, there'll be different flavors, but there's a lot of different options in different parts of town. I think there's something magical about being downtown. We have such an awesome downtown. It's like you can, you can park here and you can walk anywhere downtown. Um, after this event, there's, you know, I'm going to walk over to the W where there's a show going on. There's a million other bars and things to go to and places to see. Uh, and uh, it's just, it's, I just love being downtown. We have such a great, town, great downtown, so that, that's great. But there's, wherever you want to be, there's other places. So a couple years back, I think it was some conjunction guys were looking at a little more formal kind of approach to the, down, to the startup scene downtown. Is that is there anything there? Are you guys participating in anything like that where it's trying to organize and structure the one? Yeah, so I think what you're referring to is a project that was called Startup District. Yeah. And it's actually a nonprofit that was created that I believe I'm on the board of now. It's kind of, um, it's been kind of, uh, it, it's, it's, it's somewhat, a little bit dormant. Um, it's, I think the vision of it is still really true, and it's something that I think about and talk about a lot, and I talk about other people a lot. We use that word a lot still, like Startup District, Startup District. Um, in some ways, I, I think actually by default, right here, this downtown corridor is becoming the startup district because there are a ton of startups up and down 6th Street above all the bars is office space and there's a bunch of startups there. Obviously, we've got a whole bunch here right in this space. Um, Mutual Mobile is right there. And then this blue building, uh, which you might be able to see across there, uh, just opened up about 50 or 60,000 square feet with almost all tech startups moving in there. Um, Mass Relevance is taking over the ground floor. I know a couple other startups in there too. The next building down is the Perry Brooks building. They've got a whole bunch of startups in there, spare foots in there, others. So, um, so I do feel like actually the central business district is quickly becoming the startup district. But, um, but there's also talk about other, th you know, other things we can do too to try to make that better and stronger. And we always thought it was going to be over on the east side, over where Conjunction was. That was kind of the original thought was like do it somewhere cheap. But it just kind of evolved that it's, it's actually becoming downtown. And I think when you talk about competitive advantage, you can look at that. I mean, where else? You got Silicon Valley, you got New York, you got. But is there anywhere else has potential to have sort of that that core aggregation in an area of size? You know, it, it's, it's, I'm sure if you compare it to Silicon Valley, they have probably 10 of these, and so well, it just doesn't feel that way. Yeah. Um, but, um, but you know, the thing about Austin that's so interesting is I, I feel like we're just at we're just at the perfect size. We're like, you know, it's like it's 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 big enough that there's energy and there's stuff going on and there's like enough stuff to do and enough people to mix with. But it's not so big that you get lost in all of it. It's, it's, it's not so big that like each individual thing isn't special and really interesting and unique by itself. And, and to me, that's what's really great about it. Like I don't, you know, I like kind of like being a big fish in a small, in a medium-sized pond. You know, like rather than necessarily like drowning in Silicon Valley. Uh, but you know, it's different for everybody. I don't think Silicon Valley is a bad place. I still end up spending a lot of time out there. Um, I, you know, we still want. I still get them investing in our companies here and you know, things like that. There's all kinds of companies we need to partner with that are out there. There are a lot of companies that have, you know, start in Austin and they end up with an office in Silicon Valley, particularly like a sales or business development office. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so, um, so it's not like it doesn't have to necessarily be here or there, but that, that is what I love about Austin. I just feel like we're just at that perfect size right now. So um, places to go hack, to go work. Um, one of my favorites is Cafe Bedouins. This is a, uh, as the name implies, they are a group that, of nomads that travels from coffee shop to coffee shop, um, hacking and using up their wireless. And so basically it's just programmers that show up one place, um, I think it's Tuesday nights, and uh, they just all show up and work on projects. A lot of them working on side projects, some of them working on their day job. They just get to be around other people and, uh, and, and kind of share ideas and help each other as they work on things. Hack Texas just happened for the first time uh, this month, or this past month. And that was uh, a hackathon at UT with probably 200 people participating. It was one of the biggest ones I've been at, which was really, really great. So hackathons basically just were a whole bunch of, not just programmers, but mostly programmers, and then often other people that are helping them um, basically lock themselves in for, like a lock-in for either 24 hours or weekend or whatever, and, um, and work on stuff. Three Day Startup is an excellent program. It started here in Austin at UT and really focuses on matching up um, people uh, in a group and literally locking you in for a weekend to uh, come up with a startup idea and come up with a minimum viable product by the end of it. Um, startup Weekend is a similar program that uh, both of those have ex expanded around the world. A lot of people, when they hear that, they think, oh man, who's going to really make a startup in a weekend? Um, and you know, and I think that's actually probably pretty true. Like, I mean, there's probably a couple times where they made something of a real startup in a weekend, but you know, it, it, to me, that's not what it's really about. It's really about the experience. Um, 
And even just the thought exercise of having to go through thinking through starting a company and trying to get through the whole cycle by the end of the weekend is a really helpful process. Um, it, you know, for me doing my first startup, one of the reasons I was so excited to get to the end and start over was it, it's kind of like a racetrack analogy. Now I've been all the way around the lap. I knew where the turns were. I knew what I wanted to do. And that second time around the lap is a lot easier. And so that's a little microcosm of that is that you get to go practice doing a startup for a weekend. But probably more important that, than that is the opportunity to work really closely with a lot of other people and meet other people and really kind of test them out. You, know, you can interview people, you can go hang out with people, but like the way you really get to know what it's like working with somebody and whether they're gonna be good to work with is working with them. And this gives you like a really intense focused time where you work really closely with other people. And I think it's an incredible way to find co-founders or other people that you wanna work with. And it's not even just the people that you might work with on your team. You might have a team of four or five people. But if you're there, you see all the other people working too. And you know, oh, that person over there was badass. Look what, look what they did. Look what they accomplished this weekend. Look what they did. Or, man, those people, yeah, they went home at midnight. But those people, they busted their ass all, all night. Look what they accomplished. And like, you, you figure out who the winners are and who you want to go work with. And I think that's an incredibly valuable uh, component of it. There's health hackathons. There's Microsoft hackathons. We try to host a lot of them here uh, <clears throat> at Capital Factory. Um, but they're going on all the, all, all the time. Uh, and last April, I want to say there were like four hackathons in April. Like it was just happening, they all lined up and they were like every weekend there was a hackathon or even one weekend there was like two of them. Um, so they're going on all the time. And then there's just the actual meetups. Um, most of these right now actually happen here in this, in this room because um, we, we, it's one of the only rooms that's big enough to do this. Um, a lot of these have outgrown kind of the 40 person conference room that they might have started in. Um, but, uh, but there's tons of meetups around town. These are some of the bigger ones. There's stuff going on almost every night of the week. These are all things you see in the Startup Digest. A lot of these meetups end up having 75 to 150 people show up. Um, so like, you know, this is probably, I don't know, maybe 70 people here right now, 6, 70, 80 people. So this is kind of common. Somebody would be up here right like I am right now, but they'd be giving a presentation on the latest, coolest new Ruby on Rails gem. Or they'd be talking about some you know, new node project they just built or they'd be having a, a meetup for co-founders to meet each other and do things like that. Um, and it's just, it's just going on all the time. And so whatever it is you're into, there is probably already a meetup to go do it. And if not, you can probably announce it and there'll probably just like a, you know, 20 people will show up and you'll find other people like you that wanna work on interesting things. Almost all of these meetups are hosted on meetup.com. So that's a great place to go find them. If you go to meetup.com and just search for meetups in Austin, you will see you know, a listing of 50 of these things going on all the time. Uh, it's a great way to plug into them. And there are a bunch of incubators here in Austin, also called accelerators. There's all kinds of words for them and names. Um, Austin Technology Incubator is the, 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 the most mature, the one that's been here the longest and helped the most companies. It's a, a nonprofit that's attached to the University of Texas and um, in particular has had a lot of success with uh, uh, silicon chips, uh, kind of hardware companies, biotech, healthcare IT, wireless solutions. Um, they've, they've got a lot of different specialties and they've been very successful at helping companies to raise a lot of follow-on funding and commercialize technology coming out of the university. Although they do not, it's not exclusively for university technology or companies or, or entrepreneurs. Um, you're here at Capital Factory. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that on its own. Dream Adventures just came to Austin. Um, they've, that's a, a program that's been based out of uh, New York and Philly and Israel. They're going to be running a program here the, in the spring that's going to be based here at Capital Factory. Um, like Y Combinator, Techstars, and Capital Factory, they bring in seed funding and mentorship and, and help uh, to grow your company. Incubation Station is a really great program here in Austin. Um, they are like a uh, similar type of program, except they are focused on CPG, consumer packaged goods. So they're, um, the people in that program are making granola bars and uh, workout clothes and uh, you know like real stuff, like the, the, not the stuff we make or I make. Um, and so that's a great program. They've had, they've had one program go through. I think they may be just about to start a second one. It was a great program. All five companies they had in it, I thought, were really strong companies. I think they all got funded and are you know, moving on to do great things. It's a really great program. And then just down uh, about an hour and a half south of us in San Antonio, we have Techstars Cloud. Um, which is a vertical tech stars program focused on cloud solutions. You know, it's, you can call it vertical, but like, what solution is not a cloud solution these days? Like, almost everything is a cloud solution. So it's pretty broad. It can do a lot of different things. And tech stars is a great program. It's uh, you know, arguably, arguably the best. And um, they have many other locations, but they're here in San Antonio. And uh, I believe their applications are still open. If you're interested in, in applying for that, uh, their program will kick off uh, 
in the, in the spring as well. So I'm uh, really fortunate to have a lot of the support around for helping startups uh, go. Um, you might not need it, but, uh, but if I were doing a startup right now, I've already done a bunch of them, I think I would, I would and I wasn't running one of these, I would, I would still go do this. Because it's, it, you know, it's not just one, as much as, I mean, even being a mentor in these programs, I learn as much from the other people going through it as I, as I help other people, and I learn as much from the other mentors. Um, and it's part of the, the community piece. It's I really want to be part in a, a, of a community and around other people that are doing similar things to what I am. Mm -hmm. And that, that's going to you know, create opportunities. It's going to energize and, and, uh, and, and, and inspire you to, to do more. Um, it'll make you work harder because you're going to see them work in other teams working near you or next to you. It's another reason to be in a co-working space. Um, it's, it's really something I'd recommend. And so Capital Factory, which we are here, you know, we started out as an incubator. And uh, we've now somewhat grown into something more. We're still doing our incubator program. Um, we put it on hold this summer as we launched this space. Um, so right now, what we're really, we're really trying to be is, is a, a magnet that draws in a lot of the best talent and, and startups in Austin. We, gives them a home and a place to be together and have these things uh, merge. Our focus in particular is on startups that can get profitable on less than a million dollars in funding, which are typically going to be software companies. And typically, and obviously, need to, if you're going to get profitable on less than a million dollars in funding, you have to have some idea how you're going to make money and what your revenue model is. Um, but there's a growing number of those businesses. That's what we're really focused on. And um, with any of these programs, the thing that's really going to make one stick out of the other, over the other for me is it's the people involved. And so depending on what kind of company you're doing and what you want to do, you're going to, kind of like the co-working spaces, you're going to gravitate towards one or the other pretty clearly. And, uh, you know, and, and so I'd really look really closely at who are the people who you get to be involved with. Um, and, uh, and that's going to you know, be a big difference. With Capital Factory, all I try to do is just get the very best mentors and other people in town to be part of it. And my, our bar is really, really high. I think that's what sets us apart is we have a really high bar. And so my bar is in order to be a Capital Factory mentor, you have to be what someone I would want to be my mentor. Like basically, I'm the worst mentor. That's like my, that's the rule. So if, if, if I would want them to be my mentor, then they're a good Capital Factory mentor. Um, and, uh, and that's what we're trying to, you know, to bring to the startups that come through. And, and, and mentors are so helpful. They just bring in so many different things. One, it's just that they've been around that racetrack, right? They kind of can see what's around the next corner and warn you about it before you go do that. Um, they can save you from making a bunch of mistakes um, and uh, just from wasting time on things. When you're a startup, you know, the problem is not knowing what to do. You know a million things you need to do, right? It's like, I need to do this. And it's, it's very overwhelming. And what's really hard is actually figuring out what not to do. <laughs> and what to focus on, and, and that's where someone with a little bit more experience can be also really, really helpful. Their Rolodex is incredibly helpful, so just being able to get introductions, whether it's introductions to opening doors for potential clients, really, really valuable, because all these mentors have had all kinds of other cu customers that have worked with them. They've got personal relationships with, with them. They can make those introductions. They've had hundreds or thousands of people work for them, so when you're saying, hey, I really need a good sales guy that can do blank, 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 it's like, oh, I know somebody like that. I just might work. Let me introduce you to this person. Or and they worked with lots of vendors. Like, oh man, I really need a lawyer. I really need an accountant. I really need someone to help with my SEO strategy. I need someone to do this. Rather than you having to go like look at a directory and get a list of 15 people and call each of them and go meet with each of them, the mentor's just like, oh yeah, let me introduce you to these two guys. Pick whichever one you like best. I know they're good. I know they're not going to charge you the wrong. You know, they're not going to overcharge you or anything like that. I know they're capable and they can do it. And uh, and I've worked with them before. That can save you tons of time and be super helpful. So there's a bunch of things that mentors can do to really make a big difference and uh, really just to, to accelerate what it is that you're doing. Um, and uh, and that's why that's why I, I am a big fan of it. Yeah, it would be interesting to hear how the Austin startup community had an impact on your success as an entrepreneur. Like concrete examples. <laughs> sure, that's a great question. So you asked, you know, how has the Austin startup community had an impact on me? And I would say, you know, to start off with it, it really starts with Trilogy, which is what brought me here. Um, I was graduating in 1999 um, with a CS degree. Um, for more of the history lesson, um, 1999 was the peak of the dot-com boom, the first one. So that was like a really crazy time to be graduating with a CS degree. There was a lot of, uh, you know, people throwing money at, at um, you know, talking being in a bubble. That was the bubble. That was like the first internet bubble. Um, and, uh, and Trilogy brought me here, which was huge, and plugged me into so many of these other people that I that now still work with and still have relationships with and still want to you know, go higher and bring the things I'm doing or I'm angel investing with or I'm uh, our other mentors in Capital Factory. Um, and, uh, and then the next thing that I really plugged into was Bajoy and Bootstrap Austin. 
and that introduced me to Brett Hurt, the founder of Bizarre Voice, which then I ended up helping to build the first version of Bizarre Voice, which was both an incredible learning experience and also made me millions of dollars, which was nice too. Um, and uh, and 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 you know, just awesome being so open. I've been able to just connect with so many different people. Like I just went out and worked it. You know, like I just reached out to people I wanted to meet with and, and wanted to connect with, and Austin's so open and welcoming, I was able to do that. Um, and uh, you know, that might be true other places, but that, that, I think that's really how it helped me. Um, at another level, you know, like I've been here now almost 15 years, um, the, the startup seems a lot more mature than it was. When I first came here, it was like the peak of 1999. It was like super strong, but then within a year, it was like, psh, like it was two, summer 2000 and things weren't like that anymore. And, um, and you know, I didn't really feel it, but I, everyone talks about it like Austin went through kind of a trial, like kind of like a tough time in the startup scene for a couple of years. So it's like everyone's kind of heads down and maybe feeling a little burnt by the whole startup bubble thing, um, and then we kind of climbed out of it. So I think most recently I've been really fortunate to be part of, I, of hopefully of helping you know helping to grow that, and that's been certainly person you know very personally rewarding. Um, and then as I went to like I, my last startup was called Other Inbox, I sold it about a year ago. When I went to raise money for that. Because I had plugged into the startup scene so much and was working with so many different people, but that made it a lot easier for me to go raise money and get funding and hire people and do a lot of other things that make, to make my startup successful. But certainly it's going to be different for different people at different stages. I think it's better now than it's ever been. It's so much easier to plug into these things and do things than it was when I first came. And there was no Bootstrap Austin. And there was no Capital Factory. And there was no... There was no conjuncture. There were no co-working spaces. These half of these meetups weren't happening. You know, it's just like it, it wasn't any, anything to what it is today. So another great resource for Austin is AngelList. Who's heard of AngelList? Good. That's more than usual. There's a bunch of AngelList stickers out by the front if you want one. I'm, I'm a big fan of, uh, of stickers if you can see my laptop. Um, but uh, AngelList is uh, is basically a social network like Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter for startups and investors, like those are who it's matching up. And it's like the people who made it studied Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter, and they're, they're really smart people. And, uh, and they figured out the true social engineering, the things about Facebook that actually make people take actions like when people comment on things and how seeing people comment on things gives you confidence in that thing. And when you have followers, like having a lot of followers, although maybe, I don't know if it really should be, but it gives people credibility, right? Like you believe in something, oh, they've got a lot of followers, so they've done something, right? Th those things cause little mental things to go off in our brain, whether it's conscious or not. And AngelList took all of those things and designed them to convince angel investors to write checks. So like everything about this site, I, I think, is designed in favor of the entrepreneur. And I won't go so far as to say it's designed to trick people into writing checks. But it is like, it is like all engineered to make them feel comfortable writing a check for this startup. And so they basically take everything you do, all the actions that happen, and it builds on your profile to make people feel more and more comfortable writing you a check and making an investment. One of the greatest things about AngelList is you can basically, it, using it and by sending everybody that you go talk with to it, you can effectively get people who did not invest in your company to still help you go raise more money. Because the fact that they followed you on your profile, the fact that they left a comment, the fact that they asked for an introduction, all these things are little counters setting off triggers that then make it easier to get other people to go do that. Um, and it's really just an incredible service. And because of that, um, I was able to go raise millions of dollars for other inbox through investors that weren't from Austin, from Silicon Valley, from New York, and some other places. And I've been able to help dozens of other companies raise tens of millions of dollars for their startups through AngelList here in Austin. And, um, and it's, it's just a really powerful tool, and it really works. It's not uh, a silver bullet. You still got to work at it. You're not, if you have a, uh, uh, the, if your company's not in the right spot, it probably won't raise money. That's not going to, you know, it's not going to make a company get funded that shouldn't get funded. But it's an incredible, incredible resource. It's something I really encourage you to check out. And one of the great things about it is you can go on there and, um, wow, this is really small. Um, but what this is showing is for Austin, all of the angel investors, everybody who said, I'm willing to invest in Austin startup companies. And so when you ask, is there enough, somebody asks, is there, you know, is there enough money here? Is that the problem? Well, there's, this says there's 1,400 people that have gone to the site, registered, and specifically said, I'm interested in Austin companies. So that sounds like a lot to me. Uh, I also know, because I, I do this, I take these screenshots every once in a while. A year ago, that was half as big. So there's a lot more people coming and more people um, latching on. 
And you can access those people. You can go find the list of everybody who said they're interested in investing in Austin. And you know their names, and you have links to their LinkedIn profiles and their Twitter accounts. And you can go stalk them and like get them to come <laughs> invest in your company. Um, what's better than that is you can actually go cross-reference it and be like, OK, I want people that are interested in investing in Austin who also are interested in email, if that's what you're doing, or e-commerce, or security, or online video. And you can narrow that down to get to a really targeted list of people that are much more likely to be interested in what you're doing. And you can say to them, hey, I want to talk to you because I know that you're interested in online video. And because you have you can see the other investments they've made. Because you've invested in this company, and this company, and this company, you'd really get what we're doing. And you, I think you'd be really interested in what we're, what we, what we're building. And um, that's incredible, a huge resource, and, and really, really valuable. So I'd really encourage you to check out AngelList. Uh, and even through that, you can see just like who the top investors in Austin are. Like, you know, just they, they're ranked. It says how many investments they've made. Like, you know, like you can figure out who's writing checks, who's not. You know, um, so we're most of the way through here. Got a couple, couple more parts. We're gonna talk about venture capital. We're gonna talk about UT a little bit. Um, so venture capital can't talk about venture capital in Austin without talking about Austin Ventures. They are the 800-pound gorilla. Um, they are the biggest fund. They have about four billion dollars under management. I think across like 10 different funds. And, uh, and they, if you, you know, most of the really big companies and success stories in Austin, Austin Ventures was behind. That's just, that's just the fact of it. Um, and so uh, Bizarre Voice recently, Homeway recently, up and coming ones like Dodges Group and Spiceworks and Whale Shark, these are, these are all Austin Ventures company. Um, they have, you know, it's a $4 billion fund. They have got a lot of people there. It's not all the same thing. They do everything. So they do growth capital. They, they, you know, they invest in really big growing companies. They do early stage capital. They'll write a couple hundred thousand dollar checks to startups. Um, if I had to, and so you can't just put them in a box and say this is what, we, what they do. If I had to say they have a sweet spot, I feel like their, their sweet spot is finding a really experienced entrepreneur who's done, some, done, who's done this kind of thing before doing the research to really identify a key market they think is a big opportunity that's fragmented. And their magic number is $50 million. Put $50 million into buying up all the companies in that space and make and rolling them up into like one big company. And that's what Whale Shark is. That's what Dodges Group is. That's what um, uh, Homeway was, um, Homeway is. So that's what a number of their, that's kind of their, you know, they do a lot of different things. You can't just say that's it. But like that is kind of their sweet spot. That's what they're really good at. And uh, those companies become multi-billion dollar companies. Um, and so uh, Austin Ventures is, is a huge force here and very supportive of all the different things going on as well. They pretty much sponsor every other entrepreneurial activity or thing happening in town. One of my other favorite VCs is a company called uh, Silverton Partners. Um, it was actually started by one of the founders of Austin Ventures that then went off to create his own kind of smaller, a little bit more boutique fund. And uh, another capital factory mentor, Kit McClanahan, who's a very successful serial entrepreneur, um, and Morgan Flager are the, the partners that run that. They work with a bunch of great companies in town. They've invested in quite a few capital factory companies. Um, and so we obviously think about things the same way. Um, and uh, and uh, I just I, I really enjoy working with them. So they're one of my kind of go-to places right now. Rudy Garza over at G51 Capital is another uh, local firm. They're probably, uh, it's a, there's one, par uh, yeah, one partner. They're probably not quite as active, but they're making investments every year and doing a bunch of interesting companies. Um, Wild Basin is uh, another firm in town. Um, they're doing, uh, it's, I, think, I think it's a family fund, but they're pretty active and, and participate in the Central Texas Angel Network as well, which is, uh, we're so fortunate to have here that CTAN, as you'll often hear it called, is the most active angel investor, or one of the most active angel investor groups in the country. I think they rate at different times. I, I don't know if it was the most active or the second most active. It's really active. They write a lot of checks. They have a lot of investors. They're looking at deals every month. They're easy to get in front of. Um, just yesterday, the day before, they were doing office hours here. There were probably like 50 or 60 entrepreneurs lined up and like 10 or 20 investors all going to meet with them. Um, so they have events going on all the time. And, uh, and they've invested in a lot of great companies. And, and I've, I, I'm a member, and I've, I've invested in, in quite a few companies uh, with CTAN. So uh, that's a, another great resource if you're looking to get funding. Um, kind of think of that like that's the local angel list. And then angel list is a way to go get out to you know, people outside of Austin. And then there are, you know, there are a number of VCs and, and, and kind of super angel firms, not in Austin, but that are focused on Austin. And one of my favorites there is, is 500 Startups. That was started by Dave McClure. Another partner there, his name is Paul Singh, who comes to Austin a lot. And um, they are very internationally focused. They're based in Silicon Valley, but that's not their focus all over the world. And they like Austin. And I think they've made four, I think they invested, there were 16 companies at Demo Day. I think they invested in at least four of them, maybe five. Um, so that's like how many investments they've made in Austin in the past two months. Um, 
So they're really active, they write checks, they're easy to work with, they're very progressive, they're really thinking much forward thinking, they're really data driven, um, much more than I think other traditional VCs. They're like looking at like, they want, they're gonna come ask you like, can I have your GitHub login? Like, can I see what you're checking in? Can I go, let me see your Google Analytics stats. Like they're, they're, they're pretty um, data driven and uh, I think really sharp and uh, they were an investor in another inbox in, in my company, um, and they've invested in lots of other great Boston companies, so definitely worth talking to. And they are, I believe, the most active angel investor on AngelList. Uh, Floodgate Capital, um, or Floodgate, I don't know if it's called Capital. Floodgate was uh, started by Mike Maples Jr. Mike Maples is an Austin native. His father, Mike Maples Sr., was an executive at, at Dell. Uh, Mike Jr., when he was here in Austin, helped start Motive, which was a very successful company that went public. Um, and, uh, and he's then gone on to invest in lots of other great startups. He's now in the Valley, but has still strong connections here. He was one of the early first investors in Twitter, in Dig, in Chegg. Um, he invested in Bizarre Voice, in Spare Foot, and others. Um, so he's just a, a great investor, both, both in seemed to make really good choices about who to invest in, but also um, really, really smart guy to be helpful in figuring out your strategy and building your startup. And uh, first round capital, Josh Koppelman and his team, they're based, in, uh, they're based all over the place. They started out in, in Philly, New York, uh, but really one of the best investors uh, in the world and really open to investing in Austin and, and, and somewhere that I, if I was going to look for capital, these are the places I would go first. I would talk to Silverton, I would talk to Austin Ventures, I would talk to Plugate, I would talk to First Round. Um, those, are, those are the places that I would pick first. And, uh, and finally, Union Square Ventures. That's uh, Fred Wilson, if you ever follow him on, on Twitter or see him in his blogging. Um, they're based in New York. Uh, they were invested in Indeed. Um, they've invested in other Austin companies, and I know they're also really open to it. So I think those are some of the some best companies, best firms outside of Austin that are investing in Austin companies. So we're just about at the end. Thanks for hanging with me there, and we'll still have some time for more questions. Um, but last, I want to talk to the University of Texas a little bit. Um, it's really almost like its own little city. Uh, it's right up there. You might be able to see the, if you can see past the Capitol, you might see the, uh, the UT Tower. And um, so if, for geography wise, it kind of goes like the uh, university, the Capitol, downtown, South Austin. Um, and uh, the university just has a ton of resources for entrepreneurs. They've got, got like 60,000 students. I think it's the largest university in the country. And they have the largest computer science program in the country as well. And it's ranked number eight. So they're just churning out computer science and, and not, not, never to mention all the other engineers that end up being doing computer science anyway, too. Um, so there's churning out engineers, they're turning, churning out software people, and, uh, and they've got a great entrepreneurial community that can support both things happening at the university as well as the rest of the city. So um, one of them that I'm involved in is called longhornstartup.com. We actually just renamed it. It, it was uh, what's called One Semester Startup. And this is a program for um, undergraduate entrepreneurs in particular. Um, we have a seminar series that uh, we're bringing great speakers to inspire the entrepreneurs and give them examples and those role models that we talked about. We have a lab where uh, startups actually get significant credit for graduation for time working on their startup. And we connect them like an incubator program with industry mentors to go help them and give them, give them guidance. Um, and then we also just are launching a studio which is for professors looking to take their technologies and commercialize them and take them out. Um, and so that's a great program, and we're always looking for uh, mentors to come help uh, help the students. Um, and um, and you know anybody, probably any of you, might be able to be good good mentors for that as well. Um, and other things to help support the, the student the student entrepreneurs that we have there. Uh, there I mentioned the Austin Technology Incubator already. Uh, again, they're the old the, the oldest incubator in Austin, and I wouldn't be surprised if they're one of the oldest in the country. Um, and very, very successful with a great track record of helping companies to raise money and be successful. Uh, Texas Venture Labs um, is another great program. That's been more of a graduate program uh, based in the McCombs Business School and run by Rob Adams. But uh, really great training in um, getting kind of core skills around entrepreneurship, around customer development, um, matching them up with real industry experience and helping those companies to get funded and, and grow. They run the uh, Texas Venture Labs Investment Corporate uh, uh, Competition, which used to be called Mood Corp, but is one of the bigger um, uh, kind of business plan competitions in the country. Um, it brings a lot of attention here to Austin and the UT, and so we're, we're really glad that they're here. There's a Technology Entrepreneurship Society. This is more of a student-run organization at UT, but they're kind of plugged into most of the different things going on, um, put on a lot of events. If you're hanging around UT, you'll get to know the AT&T Center, which is a, a hotel and an event uh, conference facility that's on campus where a lot of great things happen. Um, we've hosted demo days there. There'll be all kinds of other events you'll go to that'll be hosted at the AT&T Center. And then I mentioned before Bob Metcalf. We're so fortunate to have Bob here. He came here about two years ago. 
Bob uh, uh, invented Ethernet. Um, so in his own way, you could say, uh, was responsible for inventing the Internet. Obviously, there's a lot that goes into the Internet. Um, after inventing Ethernet, he founded 3Com, which became a multi-billion dollar company. Um, he had many other very, very successful careers. He was the editor of InfoWorld. He uh, was a, most recently a venture capitalist at Polaris in Boston, invested in lots of different startups. And uh, now, as his next career, he's moved to Austin. He's a professor of innovation at the University of Texas. And um, that's just been so incredible for Austin. Um, yeah, we, one, Austin has really celebrated him and, been, and really, in some ways, put him up on a pedestal because we're so glad that he's here. And he's just so generous with his time and helpful and, uh, and uh, is really uh, spurring more and more entrepreneurship at the university and throughout all of Austin. And uh, I've been so fortunate, personally, to get to spend time with him. Um, I teach the, the class with him at UT, and I get to learn from him every day. Um, and uh, and it's, just, it's just awesome. We're so lucky to have him here. And, and he's somebody that's really approachable, easy to find. He's at all these different events. He'll be at Three Day Startup this weekend, I'm sure. He'll be, you know, uh, he'll be at, he goes to a lot of meetups and other things. He's here for happy hours. It's just really easy to find, easy to talk to, and, uh, and super, super helpful and inspiring. So I'm just about done. Um, one thing I want to mention is a book that recently came out by a friend of mine named Brad Feld. Um, it's called Startup Communities. And so if you are interested in the things that we talked about today, um, a lot of that's, you know, uh, uh, this book really talks about a lot of these, co these core concepts of what makes a startup community, what makes it successful, and compares communities to different places around the, around the, around the country. Um, so uh, so that, that's just another interesting thing on this topic. And then finally, I wanted to close with just um, Another example that Bajoy gave me, but, uh, but, but it came out of first um, of some quotes from Paul Graham, who started Y Combinator. And I think actually, um, I believe now that this may actually be then paraphrasing from a book called um, uh, The Creative Class. Um, what was the guy? I forget the name of the author that wrote it. But, um, Richard Florida, Richard Florida. Florida. yes, um, thank you. So, um, so I think this may actually come from him, but, but the direct quote was through Paul Graham, and he said that you know, cities each have these unique ambitions that make them stick out. And so in Boston, it's be smart, it's about the universities there. And uh, in Silicon Valley, it's be powerful. And in uh, New York, it's be rich. In Los Angeles, it's be famous. <laughs> and in DC, it's be an insider. And in Austin, it's to be yourself. And that goes into bootstrapping. That goes into you know, a lot of things about why you choose to be here when you maybe could be somewhere else, but you're choosing to make your life here and just grow your company here. And that's really, I think, the theme behind Austin. And that goes with entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs is about being yourself and doing it your own way and changing the world. And, um, and that's why entrepreneurs fit so well in Austin and, and why I love being here. So um, oh, we don't have sound. <laughs> Sound here. This is Josh Dilworth. His quote on Austin. I got it. Sanko can definitely be accounted for being a big reason that I decided to move here in the first place. So Josh says it's all the breakfast tacos. That's why he's here. Um, so anyway, um, that's what we got. Um, and happy to you know answer any questions. And then there's some beers and stuff. And we can sit around and talk. So where can we get the deck? Is it on your website? Or yeah, so I will. Uh, I will definitely post the post the deck. Um, uh, where will I post it? I will probably post it on SlideShare and then on, um, uh, I guess probably on the Capital Factory blog. No, the back. Uh, yeah. Follow up. Um, you posted a couple of weeks ago the tech colony versus the tech uh, dichotomy, and I know that's not a conversation that a lot of cities are having. But it's kind of cool that we are. Um, but I guess my question is, what are we missing in the ecosystem that's making us think that we I did post that article. This was an, a, an article that was came out a few weeks ago called, uh, or which exactly when, but it was you know Tech Colony or Tech Hub, and. Um, and I, I don't want to say that I, just by posting it that I necessarily agree with you know everything that was in there. Um, I think we're in a really strong spot. When people ask about you know what I get asked a lot of questions about, particularly from government people, but about you know what should we do to you know help motivate the Austin startup community? How do we help grow it more? And my usual answer is just like just stay the fuck out of the way. Like <laughs> everything is going great. Like you know like this isn't going to happen because somebody makes it happen. It's going to happen. It's, a lot of it happens organically, and I feel like. We have all the right things. All the right things are happening. We just need to. Everybody needs to keep doing what they're doing and keep. You know, there's so much great things happening. Um, 
you know, uh, I, I feel like we're in a really good spot. Now that said, if I have any kind of deep um, perspective I've gotten from my, my limited years, it's that, um, that you know, things are generally, you know, life is about change. And things either are getting better or they're getting worse. But they aren't staying the same. And so the worst thing we can do is try really hard to just keep Austin the way it is. Because that will definitely fail. And it will not be good. We can't just make Austin bigger and keep it. It's going to keep, either it's going to be growing or it's going to be shrinking. And I'd much rather be in a place that's growing because that's good. So I don't want to be shrinking. And some people say, like, we don't want more people to move here. Dude, it's way better than the alternative. Okay? So we want people to move here because and I want to be somewhere that's growing and that's booming. Um, but, it, but it can't stay the same as it does that. We're going to have to keep evolving. And hopefully, we're going to be able to keep the you know, things that make Austin great and that, that culture and that attitude that we love and still keep that as it gets bigger. But, but it's going to change as it gets bigger. And, and, and to me, it's, um, I, don't think, you know, I, don't think, I don't think we can do that super intentionally. I think we need to keep, continue to nurture the organic stuff that we have that, that's working really well. Yeah, so this might be a little late, but when you're talking about the co-working spaces and the incubators, you said each of them has their own little community. Can you talk about that a little and you know what attracts people to certain ones? I can try. Um, as much as I, I've not spent a ton of time at these other places, so I can, you know I can I'm going to give you my impression of them, but I apologize. It may not you know someone else probably has a different perspective, and, and I don't know all of them super well. But for example, this is a place for startups. And these are generally startups that are um, either, that are going to, we consider high growth. And often that's correlated with ones that are going to raise money, although that's not a requirement by any means. I bootstrapped my first company. Many people bootstrap companies. But these are, you know, we, we're generally looking at companies that we think can scale and can become a, you know, a, a sizable opportunity. Um, and, uh, and again, we're focused on companies, not people. So people don't really apply to be here. Companies do, and startups do. Um, conjunctured, as, conjunctured, as I mentioned before, um, I, my impression of them is they're primar primarily freelancers. And so they are not companies, they're individuals that bill themselves by the hour, and they don't want to work from home, but they don't have a company to go to, and so they all go to this place together. And they, a lot of them, if you are a freelancer, you often don't have all the skills you need to do all the jobs you get. And so having other freelancers around is really helpful because if you're like a Ruby on Rails programmer, but there's one part that's not, you can't get the CSS to work right, and you kind of just need a designer for one hour to help you with it, there's one sitting right there, and they can help you with it, right? Um, or other things like that. And so they've got a community of, of freelancers. Um, there's a link co-working, um, which I'm going to, this is probably one of the biggest stretch. I've been there like twice. But, you know, my impression of it is it's just like kind of a, it's less of kind of the startup tech people and probably a little bit more of like, uh, professionals and um, maybe uh, you know independent business people, but that are but are not really startups or tech companies. Um, here, this is the kind of place where like everybody's got headphones on. I've heard of some places where like you're not supposed to wear headphones. Like they, they don't they think you know they want people to talk to each other. They don't like that environment. Um, some places it's going to be okay to be on the phone all the time, and everyone's going to be on the phone all the time. Other places, like here, um, we're trying to figure out we need to like designate a phone area because most people don't want to be on the phone all the time. They don't want people talking on the phone around them because they're working on product stuff. Um, so I think you're going to find those different kind of feels and, and things like that, and also look at the types of events and things they do there. Um, so you know, like we're all about hosting tech events and startup events and community things and having people here all the time. That you know. That's good for some people, it's bad for others. This is an open place. There are no offices in this whole space. So like if you need to be in an office with your door closed, you think this place sucks. Like you don't you don't want it. You know, some people walk in like, oh my god, this is awesome, this is so great. Other people walk in like, oh my god, I could never work here. Um, so there's other places that are a bunch of small offices. There aren't there's aren't big open areas, and that might be a better fit for you. So I think you're gonna find those kinds of differences. Anybody else? Great. Well, thank you for coming. And uh, I think you know there's no big hurry, but there's some drinks and stuff. We can hang out. I'll answer more questions. We can meet some of the other people here or talk to Jessica from uh, General Assembly. And yeah. Thank you.